have you a question. This question is, would you personally dare step into a flying taxi? And um, I'm going to start a poll and you can uh, answer the question in the poll. And while that is running, I would like to show you a little video from Uber Elevate. Yes, as I was saying, um, I would like to um, start my talk um, by talking about flying taxis and helicopters. Um, that is going to be the first half, and then we're going to come to the rest later on. Uh, what I brought to you at first is a little uh, landscape or a larger landscape of the drone market environment. These are all companies who are um, building, researching drones, part of drones, services of drones, and so forth. And uh, down here on the bottom left side, that is where flying taxis are, uh, are located. And we're going to zoom in a little bit. So here's a landscape of um, companies who are by today developing and building flying taxis um, or how they're called in the scientific community uh, typically eVTOLs which is for electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles and I would, I would like to present to you a couple of those more prominent um, examples so on the top left side here we have the Airbus um, a, a city Airbus it's a quadcopter, um, has uh, executed a couple of test flights near Munich. Um, it's a four seat uh, configuration, I believe. And you can essentially imagine this to be a drone that some of you might have seen or flown yourself just in a very large scale uh, with much more power and uh, able to carry uh, multiple people. Then another configuration you can see on the top right, this would be Ehang. Ehang is a Chinese company. Uh, according to the company, they're already doing um, person man flight um, in China um, for a couple of years. So this is a one or two seater, depending on the configuration, a very small hopper bringing people from A to B, uh, potentially in city environments. Um, as you can see, same configuration, a quadcopter, uh, just with a dual rotor system right here. Here's another configuration. This time we talk about Joby Aviation. Um, you see now it's looking a little bit different. Um, this uh, configuration is a so-called uh, tilt prop. So as you can see right here that the propellers can tilt. So um, Joby will take off vertically and then uh, change his configuration in midair in a so-called transition flight and then will start flying forward like a conventional uh, general aircraft. Um, and we'll come back to Joby a little bit later in this talk. Let's look at Lilium. Um, this is actually a Munich-based company. Um, south of Munich, they're sitting and they're developing their Lilium jet, uh, five to seven people. It's a similar configuration to Joby, um, but in this case, not only the props, by the, but the entire wings tilt. Um, so uh, Lilium would tilt the wings um, to take off vertically and land vertically and then um, bring them into forward position for cruise flight. Let's do two more. Here we have a very exotic uh, configuration, uh, which is called the black fly. It's a so-called tail sitter configuration. So as you can see, the little person in here is facing right upwards into the air. That's how you start. You're laying on your back. And then as you start flying, um, the whole thing uh, straightens up um, and then you can actually look forward. Um, it's a bit of an exotic version, but it's flying in California, a California-based uh, company. And uh, if you have enough money, you can already buy one of these and fly them around the green hills of, uh, of the valley. And one last one, here we have the Volocopter down here. That's the uh, newer Volo City version, um, a two-seater two aircraft. Uh, all of them are fully electric. And here we have a multi-copter, uh, similar to the quadcopter, just with 18 instead of four rotors. So as you can see, um, we are uh, approaching a very new um, field of possibilities. There's not a typical uh, air taxi so far, but depending on the company and on the application, they look very, very different. Now, where do we land? Where do we land and start our uh, air taxis if they should ever become a reality? 
I want to show to you two studies that, is, that I've uh, come across just recently. One is done by McKinsey and Company, maybe you've heard of them, um, rather prominent consultant internationally. And they just released uh, about half a year ago, um, a report uh, highlighting the importance of landing and takeoff infrastructure for such uh, flying taxis. Um, another more prominent um, investigation is from Deloitte, uh, also a consultant company, um, not just looking at signal landing and uh, uh, takeoff infrastructure, but the larger city infrastructure and different types and sizes um, of these facilities. Now, I would like to show you some of this, um, some of these so-called vertiports. Uh, that is just a fancy word for a helicopter airport and the use that uh, the term that we like to use uh, in, in the science field at the moment. Um, and also to show you that it's not a new idea at all. So um, I have borrowed uh, all these uh, graphs from a colleague from MIT um, who has written his, uh, his dissertation um, on the topic uh, of urban air mobility just about a year ago. And so he was comparing, for example, um, helipads um, that have already existed in the 60s and 70s in New York City, for example, where business travelers were shuttled back and forth between skyscrapers or to the airport and uh, back with uh, single pad configurations or multi pads So here you can see there's not just one place to start and land, but multiple ones. On the right side, you can always see the more um, modern concepts that are currently being envisioned. None of the right side is built, everything on the left side that has been the reality or is decades old. We have other ideas of building these vertiports on top of highways, highway intersections, where you can park with your car and then take off um, or over water if there's not enough space on the ground. Now, the next thing I would like to show you is some of the visions that different companies have. Um, on the top left, you can see a concept by the Vertical Flight Society um, on top of, of a transportation hub or maybe a um, shopping center, uh, and you can see multiple vehicles sitting, taking off landing at the same time. Top right corner, you see a concept of Lilium, um, who we have mentioned already before, our Munich-based company, their Lilium port. Um, there are different configurations of Uber, there's the park deck top, there's the beehive. So as you can see, not just for the vehicles, but also for the vertiports, we have very different uh, ideas. None of this has been built, it's just fancy computer pictures, but that's what currently companies come up with. Now let's get a bit more realistic. There has actually been one vertiport that has been built, um, and that was the Voloport in Singapore. Um, so this was 2019, it's about a year and a half ago for an exhibition. Um, I've actually been working with the architects of the Voloport for about half a year. We've, we've done expert workshops together um, and are just in a constant exchange on the design and all that. Um, here you can see a, a rendering. So the Voloport, as it was built in Singapore, had one landing pad outside um, with a little taxi bot that you can see here that would uh, move the vehicle back and forth inside. The other option would be to just land on top of the roof right here and be lowered into the, into the space where you can here see the Volocopter um, being placed. This whole thing stood for maybe a month in Singapore and then was torn down again because it was only for the purpose of an exhibition. So the progress on Vertiport was zero for a long time, one for about a month, and then we're back to zero for the last year and a half. Um, there are many, many questions out there on how these vertiports could look like. Um, again, you see uh, the concept of Lilium. One of the open questions is, where do the passengers board? Do they walk towards the air taxi, which is just standing out there as we do it with helicopter operations today? Or is the flying taxi um, moved to something like a terminal, similar to a commercial airport of today, and we just conveniently step into the vehicle? Another question is, where do we charge or refuel um, the vehicles? Um, is that safe to do while passengers are boarding or not? Um, and would we need specific, specific facilities for that? And then we get more technical more and more. 
Now, um, to round this up, the first half of my presentation, I would like to show you some of my own research, everything else so far of, I've borrowed from the internet and other people. Um, this is a, um, a project that I'm undertaking together with a Technical University of Munich. I personally work and research at Bauhaus Luftfahrt in Taufkirchen, as has been mentioned before. And we look at current mobility hubs, mobility structures, so where does the German population travel? And from that, we want to extract um, locations that would be suitable for vertiports. Uh, so some of the factors are uh, proximity to pro mobility hubs. So for example, big train stations, or that the access and egress time is very small so that I don't have to drive or walk to the vertiport for minutes and hours uh, to get there because then I don't have that much of an advantage time-wise and that the routing of the airspace um, is easily possible. So here you can see a little example of Bremen, Hannover and Osnabrück, um, Northwest of Germany, three different sizes, one large parking area, more of a mid-sized shopping mall um, where we could place a, a vertiport on top. And then here, just the main building of the main train station in Osnabrück with more of a small um, configuration right here. And I would like to ask you a second question at this moment. And this question is, how should your flying taxi, your flying taxi be piloted? And I would love to hear your answers to that. Okay, very exciting. Um, I will again show you a little clip as you keep voting. Okay, I will finish uh, the voting and we'll let you see it. Okay, most of you over half said autonomous flying taxi with no pilot. Sounds techy, I love it. Okay, so you would let yourself be piloted by a computer. That's very exciting. Okay, very cool. Um, thank you for your participation. This is a lot of fun, lots of fun. I really enjoy this. And I would like to jump into the second half of my presentation. Now, as I said before, we tackled flying taxis and helicopter airports for a little bit. So now let's get to the second half, how to design something that has never been built before. Um, I have to warn you, we're gonna get a little technical here. Less pictures, more words, more numbers. So I hope you're ready for that. So let's ask the question, what do we have? And then we'll see how to go from there. First one is, do we have years of experience from operating vertiports? As I was saying before, uh, as of today, there is not one single vertiport built in the world. There are helicopter landing pads, but that is a bit different. So nope, we don't have years of experience. Okay, next question. Is there a full-scale operating vertiport? And I already answered that. No, there's no, no single um, larger operating vertiport in the world. Hmm. Okay, so our base is shrinking and shrinking. Let's ask, do we understand at least the parts of a vertiport? And the question is some, some better, some not so good. So what do we do? What, what do we do as scientists if we have no experience, nothing to experiment on and have very limited understanding? First one is we make assumptions. And that is a very dangerous thing to do in science, but a necessary thing. Because if, you're, if your assumptions are wrong, then all your conclusions are wrong. So always ask the scientist what are his assumptions. The second one is we simulate. Something new that we couldn't do as much um, in past decades, but is now being made possible more and more through computational power is that we just create everything that is not physical yet in a virtual environment. So let me introduce you to a method of science that is called agent-based modeling and simulation. Um, it's a method that has uh, some history in social sciences, um, but has been more and more prominent in transportation engineering as well. And that is the method that I'm using. So what is agent-based modeling and simulation? Well, first of all, we have agents. In my case, we have passengers, so that is you and me, that is uh, humans who want to fly a flying taxi, who walk around in a vertiport 
maybe buy a Coke um, or wait for their uh, flying taxi to take off. And the other types of agents are vehicles. Um, those vehicles um, could be standing at the vertiport or flying through the air, all that is possible. So in agent-based modeling and simulation, agents have different properties um, or attributes. So for example, as a passenger, um, I could have a certain age or I could have a certain uh, yearly income. All these would influence the decisions I would make. In our case, um, let's say a passenger has a certain walking speed. Elderly people have a, sm uh, have a lower walking speed. Young people have a faster walking speed. Scientists walk very fast because they're always stressed and have too little time. Vehicles, for example, could have um, a certain amount of uh, seats. So a volocopter would have two seats, a Lilium jet, five to seven seats. Or a vehicle could have a battery with a certain capacity. Those are the agents. Now, we need one more thing for our agent-based modeling, which is an environment. You can um, imagine the environment something like a, like a very non-fancy computer game. It's like a, like a virtual world, um, except for in science, we don't have fancy graphics. We're only interested in the numbers. So um, not, not too many flashy colors. That's why my slides are mostly black and white. So we have the environment right here. And our environment is put together by, oh, let me find my laser pointer, then I can show everything to you. Here we go. Uh, put together from uh, pads where vehicles can start and land, from gates where you and I are boarding, and parking stands where we just drop off vehicles if they're not needed at the moment. And so these agents, passengers and vehicles, they just move in this environment. They go from A to B, they have certain goals, um, they want to be at work at a certain point in time, and so they make decisions. Now, let's go a little further. My simulation that I'm working with um, has a layout uh, of a vertiport, plans, requests, and arrivals, and initial population. And then from there on, we get more and more technical. We have a list of formalized rules that the agents uh, behave to. That's the results, the event list. Here we have the class uh, structure of the um, software framework. We have uh, certain procedures, and this is how my daily work looks like just a bunch of software code. This might have been a little fast, and I'm very sorry for that. So let's take a step back and go very slow and look at it step by step. Um, I have brought to you a little scenario. Uh, we call it request and pickup. Um, this is borrowed from uh, one of my master students uh, who uh, graduated from TUM. Um, a couple of months ago, and he wrote his master thesis on agent-based modeling for Virtuports. I had the honor to supervise his master thesis, and this is his material. So thank you very much, Amin, if you're listening. Um, and what, what, what will be happening in here? So we have one pad, top right, um, where vehicles, uh, flying taxis, can take off and land. We have one gate, top left, where passengers can board and deboard, and then two stands down here, with two vehicles, with two flying taxis. One of them is busy, I don't know, maybe charging, the other one is available. And we have the time step zero. So let's, let, let us unfold the little scenario. Oh, we have a passenger, he is arriving. So the passenger comes in and the vehicle um, is set from available to moving, now his state has changed, and the vehicle moves to the gate. Now, as the vehicle um, comes to the gate, uh, the passenger is still on the way, kind of walking through the terminal. Um, so the vehicle is set back to available because uh, it's currently not needed or demanded. But a couple of seconds later, the passenger arrives. And um, now the boarding process starts as the passenger goes into the uh, vehicle and boards it. Now. 30 seconds later, as the passenger has boarded the vehicle, the vehicle starts moving over to the pad with our little passenger on board. And then finally, when they both arrive at the pad, the takeoff procedure is initiated and our agent leaves the simulation. 
So what we just now had was a couple of actions um, that these two agents did. So the vehicle reacted to the passenger and the passenger was just making his way to the gate and once he came to the gate, boarded the vehicle. Now, this was a scenario with essentially two agents involved, one flying taxi and one passenger. But this is of course not what reality would look like or would not need to simulate it. Now, the power of agent-based modeling is that we can have many, many agents. They have all very similar and simple rules. Um, they're all very dumb, so to say, not very intelligent uh, vehicles or passengers. Um, but if we throw a whole bunch of them into a virtual world, that's when it gets really interesting. And now I would like to show you some results of my latest research. So um, as a scenario, I took the Munich main train station. Um, that's one of our big transportation hubs. And we're looking at a 24 hour day. So from midnight one day till midnight the next day. Um, there was a larger transportation study going on here at the Institute and I borrowed their data once again. And um, what they had was uh, about uh, 2,300 passengers over the course of a day who would like to uh, take a flying taxi. On the bottom, you can see the distribution of um, passengers uh, walking into the station and flying into the station. Now you can see it's a bit of a different scenario if you have two passengers or 2,000 passengers. So we also need a larger vertiport. Um, on, the, on the right side, you can see a vertiport layout. We have four paths on the corners and then gates and stands uh, in circles right around that. And we just throw in 10 vehicles at the very start. Now let's let the whole thing un uh, unfold. Um, when I do that uh, in my day-to-day -day, uh, business, I just click start, wait for about 15 minutes, grab a coffee, and then come back and I have a bunch of numbers staring at me. So with the numbers, we can't really do so much. So um, we need to take another step and that's what I'm gonna show you. So that is the evaluation of lots and lots and lots of numbers that are coming out of the computer. And for example, one of the things we find out is that the vehicles are active on average about 50%, which in, in return means half of the time the, the flying taxis are just standing around doing nothing. So that's, that's not optimal. But what we also see is that the average passenger um, needs about 20 minutes just to go through the vertiport. That's much less than in a commercial airport, but also if you want to get to work quickly, you will hate to wait 20 minutes in the morning. So this is not quite an acceptable time yet. On the right side, you can see how many passengers and vehicles are on the vertiport at each uh, time step. So we'll see in the morning hours, um, there we have more vehicles and barely any passengers on the vertiport. This changes right here. And then we have many, many passengers. Um, it's a bit tricky to read that, but essentially it's saying that passengers are lining up, lining up, and there are way too few vehicles to pick them up. So we have a line of about 90 passengers at, at the high point up until the very late night hours, and then the ratio switches again. Let's look at, at another one. Let's look at the paths. So here's uh, a similar chart on the occupation rate of the paths. For the morning hours, they're mostly free, so there's not so much traffic going on. And then starting at um, late morning, all the way till night, there's lots and lots of traffic. The paths are occupied um, partially up to 100%. Overall, occupancy rate is only 40%. So there is some space, there's some buffer. And one last uh, chart I would, I would like to show you which is I looked at all the uh, 2,300 passengers who are coming in and out. And the average passenger waits 90% of his processing time. So here we actually have a case that is highly inefficient and we def definitely need to change something. As I was saying, there was initial results and um, nothing to be presented to a very broad public yet, but you, you will still get to see it, a little sneak peek. And um, I also looked at the different passengers and I found the passenger who had to wait the longest and there was 68 minutes. So the unluckiest guy had to wait over an hour. Um, that was actually passenger number 69 um, and he arrived at 6.41 a.m. So somewhere here. And then you can see depending on what time of the day you arrive at the vertiport, how long you will need to wait. So early morning, that's very good. 
later later morning um, that's a bad time and then maybe towards uh, later evening you will have a better chance again okay and i have uh one last question for you and then i will uh, finish with uh, my presentation part and looking very very much looking forward to your questions after that so here's my third question which is how much would you be willing to pay for a trip with a flying taxi if your trip to work would be 50 minutes instead of 45 minutes and here you go and as you might have guessed i have one last little clip for you to entertain you as you uh, answer that question Okay, and with that, I'm gonna reveal the results of the last uh, little survey. And uh, most of you would pay about $10 to be at work uh, quicker. That's very nice. Uh, some more, some less. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions.